Hello everyone. My name is Dheeraj Lal and I welcome you to this business continuity podcast brought to you by Continuity and Resilience. I am today in conversation with the Switzerland based Rolf von Rosing, one of the first business continuity practitioners in Europe outside of the UK. Rolf has published extensively and is a frequent international speaker. He has previously held senior positions at KPMG and Ernest & Young. In this podcast, Rolf gives us an insight into the range of approaches that different governments in Europe have taken to COVID-19. Some have taken a liberal stance that it may be a violation of rights to tell their citizens what they must do. Others have put draconian restrictions in place, almost like martial law. For those organizations who want to implement business continuity, Rolf suggests an adaptive business continuity approach. Let's hear what Rolf has to say. Rolf von Rosing, welcome to BCM with Friends, and thank you so much for being with us today. To me, you have many firsts to your credit. You joined the BCI in 1998, literally the day it started, and that's because you were with its predecessor, the Survive Group, which you joined in 1994. You served on the BCI Board of Directors for seven years, from 2001 to 2008, you're one of the first to write a book on auditing business continuity. You are one of the first speakers who flew all the way to Abu Dhabi for our first Middle East Business Continuity Summit. That was way back in 2012. Just by coincidence, we've launched our latest summit literally last week. We are close to now 20 summits over the last almost 10 years. For our last summit, we had over 2,100 registrations. For this one, we expect at least 2,500. So we've come a long way. You've come a long way. In fact, you're practically now a BCM soothsayer. A number of things you've actually predicted have come true. And you also keep telling people that the swan is not black. So just to start off, what brought you into business continuity? Um, I was introduced to BCM or to handling incidents through uh, several peculiar events that happened um, during my time at Securicor, namely people would blow up uh, cash and transit vans or, you know, they would try to break into uh, warehouses and other things. So these were, if you uh, might call it that, mini disasters requiring a coordinated approach. Yeah. And that eventually sort of developed when I joined Ernst & Young in 97 uh, to becoming a, a business continuity professional, actually one of the first in, in Europe outside the UK because the American US EY practice was, was keen on establishing teams to, to work on that. Uh -huh. So that's how I sort of slipped into that profession almost by accident. What makes that an exciting profession to be in? And what does it take to be a top caliber BCM professional? Oh, well, I mean, personally, I found it uh, exciting to deal with situations in, in which you have a, a disaster, an emergency, or an incident, simply because that is when decisions are made that are a bit uh, off the beaten track, if you will. You, you have no rules anymore. You're suddenly thrown into a situation where people have to be quite intense, whether individually or in group, and where people uh, bring out the best in themselves, basically. And uh, particularly after an incident or after you've mastered that sort of situation, there's, there's a great bond developing between teams, between people, Looking back on the event, it's um, certainly not a good thing to have disasters or incidents, but organizationally speaking, the key learnings and the aftermath may be a very good thing. And um, so I suppose what I like about it is that uh, you help the organizations, you help communities and societies uh, develop more strength, develop more resilience collectively and individually. And um, it is also uh, widening the sort of field of view or vision in that you suddenly have to think together about what will happen if and what are you going to do, how are you going to support each other. So there's a, a strong human factor in that as well. Yeah. And um, so that's, I think, what I like best about BCM and, and the profession as we see it today. Absolutely. So let's maybe come to risk today and COVID-19. And uh, how has Switzerland coped, and even other countries in Europe? And what learnings can other geographies get from what you folks have done? 
Well, um, in Europe, there's a bit of a, a, a sort of mixed bag of approaches, you know, ranging from the, uh, say, French approach up until a few days ago, that uh, almost established military martial law by shutting down everything, keeping people indoors, they would only be allowed out of the flats or houses for one hour a day and only individually. That is now being relaxed, but that would have been, say, um, uh, the most extreme in terms of locking down or trying to prevent new infections. On the other end, you have places like Switzerland, as you pointed out, or Sweden, where governments said, well, we don't necessarily have the legal instruments and the, the legal right uh, to constrain people in this particular way. We can only make recommendations and only uh, sort of uh, appeal to their sense of, uh, or their common sense, really. So in, in between, you find uh, Germany and uh, Austria and others and Eastern Europe. So to, to varying degrees, uh, uh, social and, and economic life was shut down in March, and then that was lifted in, to the end of June. Um, and it was reinstituted uh, at the beginning of November in, in most countries. Yeah. Um, the numbers, interestingly, uh, during the first lockdown, as they call it, the numbers were contained and they stayed low. They stayed very low during the summer, despite the lifting of all these restrictions. And then they started sharp, rising sharply uh, beginning of October, end of September. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, as we speak, what we're seeing is that in most countries, despite the second lockdown, numbers are not what they should be. So they're not falling quickly they're enough. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're staying on a certain level. Right. And um, so there, there's debate about whether locking down the economy or society is actually an efficient thing or an effective thing. And um, that, that debate is, is ongoing. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the situation in Europe. Sure. Fair enough, thanks. If someone wanted to build upon their current resilience, uh, whatever they got thrown into, perhaps they didn't have much preparation, but everyone has had to cope. And then use this as a basis to set up a much stronger, robust program per se. What advice would you have for those entities? Well, okay, I mean, let, let's begin by saying, and I wrote a paper about this that's, that's available as a free download. I, th I think this one uh, isn't black. The swan is, I hate to say it, but it's light gray. Um, it may even be fully white. Why am I saying this? Well, you and I are old enough to probably remember 2003 and COVID-1 or SARS-1. That sort of manifested in Asia, then jumped to Canada, and then stopped at around uh, nine to 10,000 cases. And I vividly also remember 2014, MERS in the Arab countries. Um, I know it from first-hand experience because in 2003 I was in Canada for conferences and then for a holiday in the summer and in 2014 and 15 I was in places like the Emirates or in Kuwait. So we have seen this before. While we haven't seen the sort of global spread, yeah. we've seen uh, similar almost identical viruses and we've also seen um, local outbreaks uh, across various countries mm -hmm. and that should have been warning enough for this pandemic as it's now called uh, to be taken seriously and um, to look at pandemic plans. Now what people hadn't done after the various uh, episodes of you know SARS and uh, uh, various winter flus and others people had not adjusted their pandemic plans to a scenario where prolonged measures would be in place where business activity would be uh, uh, reduced, restricted, or stopped completely. And what they hadn't, or fatally, hadn't considered was that state and uh, business private sector would not be working in unison, but conflict would uh, develop between the two sort of uh, major stakeholders. Um, so the, the swan itself was white, but I think my advice to firms now, and that's what I wrote under the heading of new pandemic planning, is to understand that uh, your business as such may not be recoverable because the disruption is an external shock that is mandated or prescribed by uh, national governments, yeah. um, including more drastic and draconian measures such as the most extreme that we saw in Hungary, key enterprises that were considered uh, critical infrastructures were put under military leadership. 
Now, we haven't seen this since the Second World War, and uh, I was hoping we would never see it again, but it has happened. Right. So in, in, in new pandemic planning, I, I suppose resilience uh, must be seen from a different angle. And I think people should become used to the thought that uh, the state infrastructure or the national sort of legal framework is not necessarily going to be helpful or conducive to doing or recovering business. They may have to have a period of hibernation. There may have to be more of a preventive element in that people put aside uh, uh, provisions for you know, losses of business in future and all sorts of other uh, sort of aspects of the plan that haven't been included in, in, uh, in older pandemic plans. Also, people should and must consider and take into account that if you do not have an office anymore, and if you have a loss of staff of say 100%, um, if and where you go to remote working, there must be the infrastructure in place, there must be the services in place to make this happen. And um, it also means rapidly digitalizing processes that were manual before. Um, give you a, a critical example, in many firms, um, people are now experiencing a problem with signing documents because they can't sign them fast enough if, if they need, as they call it, a wet signature with a pen. Um, then things like in the 1960s will have to be sent around by letter, by post, and that's a very slow process. Um, if you send them documents with qualified electronic signatures that are legally perfectly all right, many, many firms and even uh, civil service, the public sector will say, well, we don't know what to do with this. We can't accept that. So I said, well, it's legally permitted to sign electronically if it's qualified. What do you mean? No, we can't accept that. So these breaks between reality and what ought to be or what is theoretically possible, I think we, we the BCMs, must work on that to make sure that we can uh, uh, continue our operations sustainably in, in remote and digital mode. Right. And that, that's one of the key learnings, I, I suppose, from, from COVID. Absolutely. And, and as we do that, does it also now start bringing in all the other disciplines like we've seen? The cyber folks have got very active right now, certainly. InfoSec is big. Maybe physical security went down partially, but you also have the concern that your offices are, there's no one there and they can be vandalized. So are we, is this also pushing us now to organizational resilience? And what do organizations need to say BCM plus beyond this? Uh yeah, I think I think we're seeing that because, uh, as a signal for the for the financial sector, for instance, the Basel Committee in August, in the midst of that pandemic sort of uh, pause, if you will, they um, put out a paper for consultation that was called Operational Resilience. Now, that's a strong signal, and uh, you have similar initiatives, uh, particularly in Europe, for you know other sectors as well. Um, and much of that, yes, is actually bringing together disciplines like BCM and cyber and traditional information security. Right. Um, often they tend to sort of uh, uh, cooperate primarily with the IT service continuity people. But then again, business equals digital equals, you know, cyber. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, earlier at the um, BCI Global Conference, it was uh, a big topic where we all had to sort of sit down and say, well, what does the cyber risk actually mean? And that goes for all sectors, whether it be private, government, military, or, or police forces. So you're right, I think it converges, it will be an overarching resilience thing rather than just BCM as a, as a standalone discipline. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, what advice would you have to entities who are now looking to implement a formal business continuity management system, uh, having in some, ways, in some ways had to cope and put in place something, but realize that this is just a band-aid and you do much more. So how should they go about doing that process and putting in place something strong and sustainable? Five or 10 years ago, I would have said, uh, read the ISO standard, set the organizational scene, uh, bring in the model, the processes, and do it the big way, as in the old way of doing a BCMS. Yeah. Nowadays, I'm, I'm a little cautious around that because we've seen too many BCM programs that have uh, cost a lot of money but that never seemed to get finished. And there was always uh, a case of gaps and internal audit having findings. And then that was quite frustrating to organizations. Now, 
I wouldn't go fully in the direction of what is now become known as the adaptive BCM approach, but um, I think almost in parallel in, in Germany, where we used to have one of the uh, most detailed sort of uh, set of recommendations, implementation framework and others for, for BCM, Again, there, the Federal Information Security Agency is going in the direction where they say, well, you should go a little more adaptive. Rome wasn't built in a day. Start small, make sure you get the pragmatic sort of maturity level one or two things in place, and then gradually over the years, work your way up to uh, level three and then level four. So I would say in a pragmatic way, if you have nothing, just start with a very sort of... Uh, even straw man BIA that gives you a rough idea of where the critical things are, mm. where the money is, and what is sort of most at risk. I then say, well, do a strategy and do your plans, but don't overdo them. There's no point in having plans that are 20 pages long that no one's going to read in the event and no one understands anyway. Make sure you have very short, succinct, concise planning and particularly in the early days, rely much more on testing and hard exercising to make sure that you have to go through the motions at least once a year. It's almost like the military. If you don't train, if you don't exercise, what you do, you clean your boots. And that's not what you want. Yeah. So basically, go for more testing, more exercising, make sure it works in practice, and then elaborate on the things as you go along. Yeah. Certainly, there will be instances when you see, oh, maybe I've spent too much here, or maybe I haven't been very efficient there. But that's for later to develop. So it's a, a constant, ongoing reliving, uh, if you will, the old GPG or ISO cycle, saying understand your business, yes, but the degree of understanding should be appropriate and commensurate with where you are in that cycle. Okay. So I would say go partially adaptive, don't go fully adaptive, as in not doing a BIA, but make sure that you do it pragmatically and you get results as you go along so as not to frustrate the organization, senior management, uh, the boards. Very valid. And, and, and the key point, as you said, don't overdo it. Just, just do as much as you need now and then keep enhancing that as necessary. Rolf, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It always is. It's again been a pleasure. Thanks a million. I hope people who see this will get their own thoughts clear. And I think as long as someone who sees this gets a new idea, get some inspiration to do something more that they've been perhaps thinking of doing but never did, then I think the time that you and I have spent today is worth it. So thank you so much and take care. Thank you, Dirard, and thanks for having me today. Thank you.